Hi, I'm Jerry Miles. Welcome to my studio. In this video I'll be covering the importance of tone and contrast in painting. I'll start by explaining why it's so important, then look at the theory behind it, and finally give a demonstration to show how this knowledge can be applied in practice. I'm an artist specialising in landscape painting and aquatic subjects but tone and contrast are vital to any style of painting. When I was young, I was set off out into the field full of youthful optimism and a large colour palette. I dreamed of capturing the moods of nature and those fleeting dramatic effects of light. I don't know how many paintings and sketches that I tore up and threw away in frustration. I realised I'd set myself a high target, but I couldn't even get off the ground. My breakthrough came when it dawned on me that black and white photographs and movies were perfectly capable of conveying mood, atmosphere and drama. So I put my colour palette to one side and I started painting in monochrome, black and white, until I got tonal relationships and contrast fully under control. So let's start by understanding exactly what tone and contrast brings to the success of a painting. In order to grasp the importance of tone and contrast, and to appreciate the vital contributions that they make to a painting, it's best to start by eliminating colour, and to work in the grey scale, or black and white. Let me explain why the mastery of tone and contrast is so essential in painting, firstly by looking at two simple shapes. Tone adds form to shape. It defines the light source and creates contrasts. In this way, it gives the illusion of depth, or the third dimension. We can now see that the apple is spherical, and the pot is cylindrical, and the light is coming from the right. As if that were not enough, tone can add pattern to form, as in the flex on the skin of the apple, and texture as in the etched surface of the pot. The texture could be shown as rough, smooth, hard, soft, wet or dry. In fact, the only thing we don't know about the apple and the pot are their colours. Tone is of vital importance in determining the mood of a painting. Different effects can be created in sketches of the same subject by adjusting the darkest and lightest tones. This is called setting the tonal scale. A bright sunny day will create strong contrasts, especially in the foreground, whereas a soft, misty morning will present a limited scale in lighter tones. Tone can be used to show aerial perspective and to give the impression of distance. Aerial perspective is the effect of humidity in the atmosphere that causes haze, mist or fog. Under these conditions, as things get further away, they become less distinct, tones get lighter and contrast between the tones gets weaker. Tone is also an important design element in a painting. It's important to think about tone in terms of the painting's composition, where the tonal shapes define the balance and the pleasing arrangement. Tone is the biggest influencing factor and can be used to create rhythm and pattern. So that's an overview as to why tone and contrast are so important in a painting. If things don't look right in a painting, then it's probably the tone that's causing the problem rather than the colour. Okay, so how do we get tone and contrast under control? Let's go back to basics. I'll give you some definitions and we'll go step by step through the complexities. Now, although gradation is often used in painting, it's much more convenient to consider the tonal range as a series of equally spaced steps, where each step gives a specific tonal value. These steps provide the tool to better explain contrast. 
which is the difference in tone between the steps. It's obvious that the further apart the steps are, the higher the contrast, and that the lowest contrasts are between steps that sit next to each other. The appearance of darkness or lightness of a tone will be influenced by the tones that are adjacent to it or surround it. This is called tonal relationships and is the most helpful tool in getting the tones of a painting correct. When different tones stand apart from each other, it's very difficult to assess the levels of contrast between them. But when these tones are touching, the contrast become very clear. Another phenomenon that we have to take into consideration is the effect that surrounding tones have on our perception of the tonal value of the colour that we're applying. If we take three blocks of the same tone and surround them with increasingly darker tones, our eye and brain can trick us into thinking that the identical blocks are getting lighter. Now the first tone that you lay in on a painting will determine the tonal scale for the whole painting. You then work out in all directions from this basic tone, carefully considering the levels of contrast with the adjacent and surrounding tonal values, looking for patterns of light and dark. I think it would be useful at this stage to analyse one of my paintings. To illustrate how the principles of tone and contrast are applied, and to look at some of these terms and definitions that I've just described. In this painting of Salcombe Harbour, I've used a limited tonal range. That's to say that the darkest tone is almost black, but the lightest tone is a shade of grey and not white. And the painting has been built up using seven tonal values. Within the painting, we can detect high contrast, medium contrast, and low contrast and there's an underlying gradation in the harbour water in the foreground. If we talk about tonal relationships and the effect of surrounding tonal values, you might be tempted to think that the sunny side of this house is brighter than the sky, but as you can see, there's quite a significant tonal difference. We know now that tone can add texture to form and it's shown here by the rough surface of the stone wall, the wet reflective surface of the water, and the smooth sides of the boat. If I now simplify the tonal composition, it becomes evident that the painting is equally divided by a lighter passage on the left and a darker passage on the right, with spearheads of light and dark projecting to either side to key the composition together. And when we look at the full colour version, I've targeted the focal point of the painting by the addition of a primary colour. But that's part of the subject matter in my next video about colour mixing and colour harmony. OK, well let's now turn to the practical application of tone and contrast in our painting. Let's imagine that we found a vantage point and we're looking out on this glorious scene in full Technicolor. Sun shining, clouds are drifting across the sky on a light breeze, changing the lighting effect as they go. And we've got to now try and distill the tones and contrasts within that colour scene before us. How do we go about that? Artists are known to use a number of different techniques, so let's have a look at one or two of them. One of the oldest methods that art artists use to determine the, the tonal relationships and contrast in front of them in the scene was a dark mirror. Now, this is a piece of glass which has been painted on one side with black 
gloss paint, dark mirror. How do you use it? Well, you sit with your back to the subject, or you stand with your back to the subject, and you look at the scene through the dark mirror. Now I must admit, it does actually determine the tones and contrasts and, and tonal relationships very well. The drawback is, as with all mirrors, the image is reversed. Next, we have the use of gels. These are the kind of things they use in theatres in front of lamps to uh, light the stage. These are smoked uh, gels. Uh, some artists like to use red because that nullifies the colour and helps to dis distinguish the tones and contrasts much better. But anyway, this is smoked. You can take one, look at the scene. If it doesn't screen well enough for what you're looking for, you can use two, and you, in bright sunlight, can even use three to look at the tonal relationships and the contrast in the scene before you. Next, of course, you can use a pair of sunglasses and look at the scene. And if that doesn't do well enough, of course, you can use it in combination with the gels to adjust. But always remembering that when we go back to work on the sketch or the painting, that we take the sunglasses off. Now, in this modern age, when we're out in the field, we can of course take along our compact digital camera or our mobile phone and we can make black and white photographs to our heart's content. And on the screens on the back of the uh, camera and uh, on the screen of the mobile phone, we can use those as reference during the day as we go through the painting process. Other advantage with that is, if you get suddenly an amazing uh, dramatic effect of light, you can photograph that and you've got that as a reference to use when you work on your studio painting later. Finally, if you're working from photographs, then you can use what they call a tonal gauge, and I'll show you how that works. Here we have a colour photograph, and we want to distinguish that tone in that area of the photograph. So we lay on the tonal gauge, that's lighter, that's lighter, that's also lighter, still light, that looks to be about right, and that's darker. So we will say that that is the tone that we want on the painting. And we take the gauge, we lay it on the canvas, and make sure that the tone that we're using corresponds to that on the photograph. I've left the most practical way of seeing tone and contrast in the scene in front of you until last. And for this you don't need any mechanical devices or photographic equipment. All you need are your eyes. So how do you do it? You squint. Close your eyes and you view the scene through your eyelashes. And in doing so, you reduce the light, dim the colours and lose a lot of the detail. And it works. It takes a bit of practice but you'll get used to it. When I'm working out in the field, I always squint and I use black and white photographs as references, as backup. I'm going to use this photograph of the village of Hope Cove in Devon, England as reference for a demonstration of the practical applications of tone contrast. Now, if you want, you can stop the video and squint at it to see if you can sort out the tonal relationships and the tonal patterns. I've sketched in the composition and I'm going to leave the photograph as an insert on the screen so that you can relate it to the sketch as it develops. And I'm also showing the tonal steps that I'll be using on the right hand side. 
I start by laying in the large block of dark tone for the thatch on the house in the foreground. This is my reference tone for the sketch and I will spread out across the composition from this datum. In this demonstration I'm only going to use flat blocks of tone without any texture, blending or gradation to serve my purpose. The shadow thrown onto the thatch roof of the second house has no difference in contrast with the reference tone so we can continue with it. The next tonal value to be considered is the wall of the cottage where we can also judge the level of contrast with the thatch roof reference. Although the wall is painted white, it's in deep shadow and I have to take care that I use a low contrast. Don't forget that the photograph has the infinite tones of a linear gradation from darkest through to the lightest tone and I'm trying to summarize it by using the tone steps. Into this wall I have to work the details of an outbuilding which is in fact the darkest tone in the composition. Next I move to the cottage wall facing the street and here again the contrast between the walls is only one tonal step on the scale. Now that the tonal area is beginning to build up it becomes easier to add in smaller touches and keep them accurately within the scale. I judge the facing wall on the second cottage to be practically the same as the wall facing the street on the first and I'm careful to leave the white area of sunlight which together with the walls of the cottages on the far side of the square are the lightest tones in the study. The further you move into the middle distance, the smaller the patches of tone become. But with careful concentration and keeping the suggestion of shape simple, it's easy to suggest detail with a few simple strokes. The largest tonal area of the composition is the shadow of the cottages falling across the street. This has a variety of closely matched tonal values, blended tones and soft edges, which I'm going to ignore and rigidly keep to my plain blocks of tone. To help the balance in the composition, I'm getting rid of that high contrast diagonal that reaches down into the bottom left corner. Thank you. 
Branching outwards and upwards, I now block in the tone for the thatch roof in sunlight, and from there I can step off into the sky. As you can see, I'm still stepping from one tonal value to the next, making sure that the level of contrast between them matches that in the scene. The further you get into a painting, the easier it becomes to lay in the finishing tones. And once I've filled in the sunlit surface of the square, I can add the touches of foliage in the foreground, and to complete the sketch, just add a few detailed jottings.
I think you'll agree that although this is a very simplified tonal sketch, it captures the mood of this sunny village scene. You can feel the warmth of the day and sense the reflected light in the shadows. It's devoid of detail and has no subtlety in the edges between the tonal shapes. But it illustrates the power of tone and contrast to convey atmosphere without any embellishment. This is a sketch of the same scene which I've taken a stage further by adding some detail, gradation and soft edges. The most significant and obvious change is the addition of the young girl walking her dog, which I've added as a focal point and a means of interrupting that strong diagonal in the composition that slopes down from the roof and continues across the edge of the shadows. The high contrast of the white dog against the dark background and the counterpoint of the girl against the lighter background holds your eye. The other difference with the original sketch given in the demonstration is that this one was painted in colour. This is yet another sketch that I've made using the same tonal scale, but in this case I've painted it with a different set of colour tints. And if we look at these two colour renditions side by side, we can see that as long as the tonal relationships and contrasts are correct, there's an allowable degree of flexibility in the choice of colour tints without disrupting the mood of the scene. While on the subject of colour, there's one aspect of contrast that has to be taken into account. I call it colour contrast, where different colour tints with the same tonal value lie side by side or form an integral part of a pattern. In monochrome, these different colours can't be identified because they're all the same grey. Colour contrast was used to great effect by the Impressionists and has to be well understood in order to manage subtle differences in flesh tones in portraiture, for example. Well, that's about everything I wanted to tell you about tone and contrast. I hope you enjoyed it. In my next video, I'll be covering another important subject in the process of painting, which is colour mixing and the understanding of colour harmony. So I hope you'll join me there.